very important topic at this moment, and it's, it's great that you have done this uh, research in the last uh, few weeks that is uh, evidence-based and it uh, has covered the global um, arena of accountants and professionals in finance. And it's really great that we have a chance to find out about it from the first hand pretty much. Uh, so just as a background, uh, we all know that at least a third of the world have gone, uh, have experienced, has experiencing a, some kind of a lockdown at these days. Uh, and um, so I think the new normal have become the empty streets and uh, working from home and uh, Zooming and things like that. So uh, it's 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 a good chance to talk about them from the policy and economics perspective. How these kind of uh, new uh, new normals, uh, in short, are affecting uh, the global and the regional picture. Uh, so uh, I think. Also, I'm happy that we're also discussing it from the policy perspective because uh, we know that the great uh, deal of pressure is being put on governments uh, about how to secure uh, incomes of people and how to uh, provide different mitigating factors to private sector and uh, especially SMEs to support their businesses. So uh, today, uh, dear participants, we will uh, present you uh, results of a survey that took place uh, with uh, uh, that ha that ACCA Global and Institute of Management Accountants have uh, done for us, and they're gladly sharing the results today. And uh, we would be happy to discuss uh, the de uh, as, as much as the details and also some of the questions uh, on a more broader scales that would include things like education, professional development, and overall how would the regular life of us would change and might change and uh, although this is a challenging time it also creates lots of opportunities so we can also discuss about what uh, things are arising in front of us at this moment uh, so without a further ado i would like to introduce uh, the first speakers today we'll have two speakers the first speakers um, from Institute of Management Accountants, uh, Elaine Mulder. He's a senior director there. And uh, he, the Institute of Management Accountant is a global membership association that, um, that includes uh, finance professionals and accountants from uh, all areas, including private sector, nonprofit, public, and academia. So uh, welcome, um, Elaine Mulder. Uh, thank you very much for joining today and uh, uh, sharing with us this very valuable information at this moment. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's really nice to, to, to be here today in this great webinar. Uh, thank you also for joining us. Uh, like you already said, uh, my name is Lam Mulder. And I'm Senior Director of Europe Operations uh, for IMA, so that's the Institute of Management Accountants. Um, before we start, maybe it's good to mention that uh, indeed, like you said, uh, ACCA and IMA did this uh, research together. Uh, we do it each quarter. Uh, currently, we are working on the next ver uh, version, actually. Um, and IMA and ACCA are strategic partners. So that's uh, one of the things we are doing uh, together. Uh, so that's very nice. Uh, so, so let's start. Um, uh, first, uh, a little bit about IMA. Uh, you already introduced the IMA, but IMA is the professional body uh, of the year, actually uh, named by uh, the Accountant International. Uh, we are one of the largest and most respected associations focused only on advancing uh, the management accounting profession. Um, and globally, IMA supports the profession through research, the CMA, Certified Management Accounting Program, continuing education. I think that one will become more and more important nowadays a networking and efficacy of the highest uh, ethical business practices. So we have more than 140,000 members in 150 countries uh, and 300 professional and student chapters. And we also have a very active chapter uh, here in uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, we are headquartered in Montville, so that's uh, 50 minutes uh, from New York, Manhattan. Uh, and we have local offices around the world uh, in our global regions like the Americas, Asia Pacific, Europe, in the Middle East and India. Um, so let's go to the research now itself. Um, the GECS, like we call it, the Global Economic Conditions Survey, is the largest regular economic survey of accountants around the world in terms of both the number of respondents and the range of economic variables it monitors. And of course, we are very proud of that. 
Um, it already has been conducted for more than 10 years uh, each quarter and its main indices are good lead indicators of economic activity and provides a valuable insight into the views of finance professionals on key variables such as investment, employment and costs. So what do we analyze in the report? Uh, well, we look at global, what is the overall picture of the global economy? Uh, more thematic, what trends are influencing confidence around the world? Uh, regional perspective, how are policies, government actions, market conditions and events impacting regional confidence? And especially during this uh, COVID-19 disruption, uh, that's of course uh, a very important topic. So before we go more into detail, what are the major takeaways uh, of the survey? So the Q1 GACS was conducted from February 28 to March 12 inclusive. And this period includes the spread of the COVID-19 virus to Europe and the US and some of the initial policy respondents, uh, mainly from central banks actually. But the major impact on economic activity from lockdowns and business closures had not yet begun to be felt. However, by this time, such effects were being felt more profoundly in the Asia Pacific region, more the source of the outbreak where it started. This geographical split is reflected in some of the key indicators in this Q1 GEX. So what we saw is that confidence fell everywhere and in most cases sharply and to the lowest since the survey began 10 years ago. The Q1 drop in Asia Pacific confidence is less than the global average, but confidence here was already relatively weak as the consequence of the US-China trade tensions. The order balance is closer to real economic activity than sentiment driven confidence and the falls in order may be less extreme then for confidence, but nevertheless are across the board. The regional pattern reflects a geographical spread of the coronavirus at the time of the Q1 survey with the biggest fall in Asia Pacific and the smallest drop in Africa. The regional index of concern about suppliers going out of business jumped to a record high of 22 in Q1 compared with a long run average of eight. Similarly, the index of concern about customers going out of business increased to 37 from 27 at the end of 2019. So by comparison, the Q1 global indices are 16 for concern about suppliers and 22 for concern about customers. So the global economy is actually heading into recession as private economic activity collapsed due to an effective lockdown in many countries. If these conditions were to persist for three months or longer, then falls in output approaching 10% will be entirely possible. And for example, during the global financial crisis back in 28, the worst affected economy suffered around a 6% drop in GDP. So now it's already worse than the major financial crisis 10 years ago or 12 years ago, actually. So, the Q1, wait, I think it's better to focus on North America now um, because we did the global um, uh, survey, but we also focus on all the regions. Um, so what we saw in North America, Asia Pacific, Western Europe, uh, that's something I will cover now. Um, and I will start focus on the three uh, most important regions. So let's start with North America and where all the indices went downwards, actually. Uh, the sharpest drop is shown in the confidence index, which infers that the economic expansion of the US, which lasted for over a decade, will rapidly come to a halt. It is important to note that the restrictive measures will lead to the economic contraction are yet to be implemented at that time. And GDP is expected to contract by 5.9% according to the IMF. And it may grow to 4.7% next year, the IMF said. So the US jobless rate, which was at a whole half century low before the pandemic, may swell to more than 10% in 2020, even though the employment index by the end of March was yet to experience a sharp decline. And what we now all see on the business news channels is that the jobless rate, of course, is very bad now in North America. 
So let's move to Asia Pacific and that includes China. So similar to North America region, Asia Pacific indices are negative where confidence is at an all time low and this clearly impacts the employment index as well. The orders index fell to the most of any region in Q1. And that is the sharp drop you see uh, in Q1, that's the blue line. So the Chinese economy will have contracted sharply in the first quarter compared with the previous quarter. Given the monthly data from indicators such as retail sales, industrial production and investment, a report which came out today, or actually uh, previous month, stated that China's GDP has shrunk 6.8% versus the previous year, and in the first quarter amid virus shutdowns. These numbers in fear that China is undergoing a historic economic slump, which only a hard recovery ahead. More recently, there has been easing of restriction as the health crisis has abated, and there are tentative signs of improved economic activity in China, such as factory reopening and increased travel. The contraction in industrial production was smaller than expected and was only 1.1%. As the quote unquote first mover in this pandemic, the world looks to China for clues on the economic impact of COVID-19. So let's have a look at Western Europe now. So actually similar to North America and Asia Pacific, the confidence index took a sharp downturn in Western Europe. However, to the previous two regions, the indices for capital expenditure as well as employment experienced an increase in the first quarter. Various countries in Western Europe have provided fiscal stimulus packages at different levels. Germany provided, for example, about 4.5% of its GDP in support, compared to 10% in the US and 20% even in Japan. The European region, or European Union, I actually have to say, and its finance ministers agreed to have a 5.40 billion euro package to support member states in early April. And Bloomberg economists suggest that this package was more of a victory for the highly in-depth countries in the European Union. And we are very curious to measure the impact of the so-called corona bonds or its equivalent in the upcoming quarters. So what are the economic consequences? Well, such extreme economic pain is being felt simultaneously across filter the entire global economy. And two of the most significant economic regions, Europe and the US, are among the most badly affected. One early message in the scale of the economic impact is the tenfold increase to 3.3 million in the US jobless claims recorded for the first week in March. So the measures introduced by governments in attempt to slow the spread of the virus are having a dramatic effect on huge wetness of an economic activity. Even businesses that continue to operate with employees working from home, productivity and output will be suffer. Such extreme economic pain is being felt simultaneously across virtual the entire global economy. And two of the most significant economic regions, Europe and the US are among the most badly affected. And one early message indeed, like I said, is also what you see is the jobless claims recorded that really went down. And we also see it on the news that it even went down more and more. So what's the financial market volatility? Well, financial conditions have tightened and the potential route to the economic downturn. The fixed index is a measure of volatility derived from the US equity market. You really see what happened with that index. And many emerging market economies are vulnerable to the effects of the change in financial conditions and risk appetite. Capital outflows many further undermine this as a flight to quality results in investors moving out of risky assets and into safe havens, such as US dollar assets, government bonds, and gold, for example. 
Well, the oil prices, well, commodity prices have fallen sharply, and especially for oil, as we all know. Every oil exporter sets its government budget based on assumption for the oil price, a very long way above the current level. Once the health crisis is over, and depending on the success of the policy measures discussed below, there should be a fairly rapid return to reasonable rates of economic growth. Some of the lost economic activity is likely to be recouped, for example, delayed purchases of customers' durables such as TVs and white goods will eventually take place. But much will be permanently lost, like we all know, including in the service sector, for example. Cancelled visit to hotels, bar, restaurants, cinemas, for example, are never regained, so those companies will suffer a lot. So what we actually saw is that the pace of this greater than during the financial crisis we had 12 years ago. It's much worse, actually. So let's have a look at the regional responses. So what we see, for example, uh, government responses in the US is an approach that was not adopted during the financial crisis. So it's really different. Uh, quantitative expenditure is intended to boost liquidity in the financial sector and prevent a liquidity squeeze. Central banks are also relaxing certain capital adequacy requirements and provide Elaine, I think we may have lost you. Do know you can still hear me, right? Uh, yes, Lucas, I can hear you. Okay, I think we may have lost Elaine. Uh, yes, uh, I think he was, uh, his connection was on and off for some time. Uh, okay. Okay, he's here. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, good. We're back. <laughs> can you still see my screen? Or? Yes, I can. I, I, we can see you, but we cannot see the presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, if, yeah. If you want, I can pull up the presentation for you. Oh, I, also, I can also do it again. That's no problem. Okay. I think something happened. Can you see it again? Yes. Yes, yes. Great. <laughs> so I was just uh, looking at Hong Kong. Uh, so what we see that Hong Kong has already done this earlier this year. And it included a part of a 2 trillion US stimulus package. That's an amazing number, actually. Uh, a more targeted approach is for the state to pay most or all of the wages of workers in affected companies. And this is the policy adopted by the UK and Danish governments. By paying the wages of those jobs that are in temporary furlough, companies are helped to survive, employees are not laid off, or they avoid financial hardship. Moreover, as conditions improve, everything is in place for a return to a normal economic activity. Other measures, including delaying or even foregoing some taxes, increasing benefit payments, and making grants and guaranteeing loans to affected companies. Many fiscal packages include specific help for small and medium sized enterprises, which are especially vulnerable since they have much less of a financial buffer than large companies. For example, in the US, stimulus pack includes a three points, a three hundred sixty-seven billion support for small medium enterprises. Much of it initially loans, which can be made into non-repayable grants under certain conditions. So the economic damage is coming months will be huge. Uh, but if appropriate policy action is taken, then conditions for recovery will be in place when the whole COVID-19 health crisis is substantially over. Mm -hmm. Once confidence is restored, this recovery should 
gather momentum, even if it's intentionally rather patchy. For now, the focus of economic policy is on preventing the coronavirus pandemic from causing significant and permanent damage to the global economy. So what are the long-term effects? So what we see in many countries, the scale of government intervention will resemble war-type conditions, huge state involvement funded mainly by increased borrowing. The fiscal cost will be very large indeed, and public sector deficits and debt will be sore. Deficits in many cases will rise well into double ditches as percentage of GDP. And this dynamic will be made more dramatic since GDP is currently contracting at a very fast pace. So for example, during wars, economies tend to grow as production is shifting from butter to guns, like we say. So as with the public sector, debts rounds up during wartime. The repayment can be spread over the coming years and decades. The ultimate outcome may be a permanent increase in the share of public spending in the economy and role of the state, similar to the experience in many advanced economies after the Second World War. The rebuilding of public sector finances after the global financial crisis involved a long period of austerity with cost in public spending, with cuts, I have to say. And approximately two thirds of the adjustments occurred by austerity with one third from higher taxation. So the Corona crisis, virus crisis may give further impetus to retrenchment from globalization. So this trend has already been established to some degree with increased protectionist measures in many areas, not just between the US and China actually. So the long-term effect of the crisis is likely to be further shortened supply chains. Their vulnerability have been exposed now. Global trade will fall sharply this year, and possibly by as much as 20%. But the question mark hangs over whether global trade will recover when eventually the global economy does. So as discussed before, fiscal policy is doing the heavy lifting in policy response. Within the Eurozone, this means that individual member states are launching their own fiscal packages in an attempt to mitigate the effect on their economies. The risks of another sovereign debt crisis will be huge increase. Even before the current economic shock, Italy was viewed by many as the most likely candidate for such a crisis. With a very high public sector debt, actually 130% of GDP, and an anemic economy. This could be the catalyst for the fiscal union that is ultimately necessary if the monetary union is to survive and to be successful. So, so this was my presentation. Uh, I understood that we will do, do, do the question and answers after the second one after the presentation from FICAS. Uh, so I will stop sharing uh, my deck. Sure. Thank you very much for You're very welcome. valuable insights. Uh, I'm sure uh, our, speak, uh, our participants uh, will have questions and I would like to encourage again participants to share your questions in the chat box. Uh, in the meantime, we can proceed to the second speaker. Um, our second speaker is uh, Vic Sagarwal. He is from ACCL, ACCA Global, and he's a regional head of policy um, there in ACCA, as well as he's responsible for emerging markets. So uh, thank you for joining. And uh, uh, could you please share how the COVID-19 is impacting the global economy and share your perspective and opinion on it? I would be absolutely delighted to. Elaine, if you would mind uh, not sharing your screen anymore. Can you still see it? Oh, I stopped sharing it. There we go, perfect. Great. Okay, Ooh, and... Here we go, right. Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen now. Oh, yes, we can see. 
yeah brilliant okay great well thank you very much um everyone for for joining this call it's it's great to be part of this and to work with aifc um i think uh it was it was great to hear from elaine on our joint ima acca global economics condition survey i think with everything that's going on at the moment it, it's only sensible to to take a look at all of that uh research and then add some uh some some greater depth and context to it and so when discussing earlier on this week it, it looked sensible to talk about uh the work specifically on our work specifically on covid and and how businesses and and policymakers are actually responding uh, I'm going to start by just going through uh, a few different areas of the report. So a bit more about the, the methodology and the survey itself, um, what the sort of key findings were, um, where um, businesses are uh, seeing performance being hit or behaviours, um, and then go through a, a quick summary. Um, much like uh, IMA, uh, the ACCA is a global accounting body. Uh, headquarters here in London in the UK uh, but we don't really talk about the UK so much in that in that we do consider ourselves quite truly global um, and again much like the IMA we believe that the accountancy profession has a purpose to it it's not just to to train finance professionals in being technical accountants it's about delivering a profession um, that can actually contribute to the global society um, this is a bit about our footprint. So we are um, something in the region of 220,000 members and over half a million students. Um, we have offices across the Central Asian region. So one in, in uh, Kazakhstan, one in Russia, one in Turkey, um, as well as uh, a number across the world. Uh, and this is really about, about um, understanding uh, domestic economies and then looking at how the profession can change the global economy. Um, our mission, uh, again, it's really uh, to, to advance the profession and we do that through, through building partnerships. Now, of course, we have one with IMA, which we uh, are very grateful for. We've worked with them for a number of years uh, to co-produce uh, the economics conditions reports as well as some other pieces of work. Um, but we do this uh, with governments, with development bodies, with, with regulators and such, um, as I said, to advance the profession, to ensure that it contributes to uh, public value and sustainable economic growth um, and of course that's why we're here today. So a bit about the survey itself. Uh, you can see in the screen the dates that it took place. Um, it was really about looking at what's going on in the world and understanding uh, what are the specific challenges that businesses are facing, um, what their response mechanisms are, whether they were prepared to, to respond or not, um, and how how we can consider this uh, this challenge going forward. So you know, lots has been mentioned about Corona and whether it will be a recurring um, issue, either on a yearly basis or perhaps you know another pandemic in in a few years time. This is really bringing out some of the the response mechanisms that that businesses can can plan for uh, for the future. Uh, the survey itself, um, this is really intended to show you how big the survey was, over 10,000 responses globally um, from all types of organisations, all types of sizes. Um, and so it's one of our biggest surveys that we've ever run uh, with a really good cross section of responses. Okay, um, thank in, in, in sort of gratitude to, to, to Elaine, he's set out the context of, of where we are after Q1. Um, clearly, uh, things are not going very well globally. Um, a number of, of sort of localized issues, a number of sort of progressive issues, ones emanating from Asia Pacific and moving westward. Uh, it's what's really interesting to see is how economies uh, or regions have differed in their responses, um, and, and some have. Uh, are still uh, feeling the effects and haven't haven't quite managed to implement uh, sufficient responses just yet. I, I take Latin America as a, as a sort of case in point that they are very much now feeling the the brunt of Corona. I mean, it's becoming the new epicenter, um, and so any shocks that they'll face, uh, we should see those probably continuing for the next uh, few quarters at least. Okay, so just quickly rounding up the implications. Um, oh, that's sped through a bit faster than I thought. Uh, what do we have? So we've got um, 
the, the biggest implication from corona is the uncertainty uh you know one can argue that this should have been foreseen and, and some organizations may have agreed with that but in the whole uh no one could really plan for this and and to be honest we don't really know where it's going the uncertainty continues um they don't know what mechanisms to to deploy people don't know what mechanisms to deploy uh, we don't also know what timeline we're looking at um some are arguing that we're, we're coming out of this now others are worried about a second wave uh some are looking at a cyclical uh, occurrence a sort of a yearly occurrence so the uncertainty is still there uh, we're definitely hopefully over the hill in terms of, of global health certainly from a western europe um perspective uh but as i've mentioned latin america we know that they are they are coming up to it quite rapidly uh in terms of the actual implications on businesses we've seen pro employee productivity uh plummet i mean of course this is a this is very much a people issue uh through either their health or their inability to work uh we've seen issues lay around cash flow which i'll go into slightly later on um rather positively we've seen uh organizations embrace the need to uh ensure health and safety is a priority um we the, the general response is that global uh, the government stimulus packages are uh haven't been effective i think i think that's probably a delay a lag in whether the effects have been felt yet but i think with new stimulus packages being brought in uh, we should hopefully see that change over time um growth of course is negatively affected um, one thing that, that has certainly come out of this is that business continuity plans um, haven't been widely uh, used. Um, those that have haven't all been that effective, um, and these are these are some quite severe challenges actually going forwards um, that that organisations will need to to think about more so in the future. Uh, I've, I've already mentioned sort of key findings. Um, there are some differences between uh, the types of organizations that we surveyed, sort of large and small region uh, and, and, and uh, sector, but on the whole, some of the effects are being felt quite far and wide. Um, in terms of organizations, we know that small and medium businesses tend to be the ones that are hardest hit um in part because of their fragility in part because of their ability to access cash uh, or, or emergency loans and so we know that certainly in in different parts of the world governments have had to respond quite flexibly to how they treat business uh to ensure everyone from a sole practitioner through to a um a medium-sized business with with you know several hundred or potentially thousand people employed uh um ensuring that they can continue and, and and continue to provide jobs okay so the survey what has the business impact been okay well you can see here that as i've mentioned uh employee productivity has 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 been has been uh severely impacted um but moving on from that really what is the organization what is the challenges faced by organizations now cash flow problems uh, are a big big issue um, and this will be uh, drawn out by a number of uh, factors so the the reduction in um, the reduction in demand from consumers uh, the ability to access finance from banks um, these are all uh, uh, compounding to create a, 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 a quite a strong degree of, of, of um, vi uh, viability for, for the sort of next six to twelve months uh, and so depending on the effectiveness of, of stimulus packages we could see a number of businesses potentially uh, quite a significant number of businesses um, either going out of businesses rolling up or having to uh, um, adjust the way in which they work um, and of course because of the interconnectivity of the global supply chain this will have knock-on effects on on supply chain partners on customers both b2b and b2c uh this is a particularly uh interesting slide so we um uh in speaking to our in in, in surveying our our, our our you know the our audience uh what has been most striking is is not necessarily the lack of preparedness that that i'll address later on is is how people are responding at this very moment in time 47 percent of respondents as you can see have not performed a financial reforecast now that is that is quite a significant proportion of organizations that are not 
looking at their cash flows for the future and whether they're going to be financially viable for much longer. Now, I'm assuming given that it's now May or sorry, it's now June, that this number uh, will have decreased. Um, but that said, given that we were really very much uh, going into the uh, to the peak of the crisis, um, that more organisations should have been prepared for this. Uh, no, sorry, not prepared for this. That they should have been taking a look at their and at their uh, their um, their viability. It's of course understandable that they would have been focusing on perhaps other issues, um, looking at supporting their staff, looking at supporting perhaps their customers, uh, understanding what government measures uh, meant for them. Um, but regardless, it's still quite a stark figure. Uh, okay, going back to the uncertainty point. Um, it's really just uh, quite quite obvious that that with a lack of clarity as to how long this crisis will continue, um, how long government stimulus packages will continue, uh, what uh, it's going to do regionally and globally um, is putting most strain on organisations. Uh, we we surveyed a number of other um, factors, so looking at uh, you know data both internal and externally. Um, analytical tools to understand what's going on with with um, global trends. Those have all uh, come up relatively comfortably, um, but in 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 the sort of shadow of how much COVID is is disrupting all of those measures, um, it just shows that that even tools, internal tools that people have had, haven't necessarily proven that effective. Okay, uh, impact on revenue. Uh, now these may seem relatively um, obvious responses, but it's worth it's worth just looking at the the, the actual severity of it. Uh, interestingly, some people see a positive outcome for this. I mean, that might just be Amazon, that might just be Zoom, um, but there are organisations uh, that are are very very negatively uh, very negative in their outlook for the year ahead. Um, and the knock-on effect of this is, as I mentioned before, looking at business viability. Um, with revenues down, uh, it only uh, stands to uh, reason that profits will be down compared to the previous year as well. And of course, what that means is, is that with revenue and profits down, uh, a number of other areas uh, within an organisation will be affected now whether that could be that could be growth that could be investment in uh, new tools that could be looking at uh, expansion into new markets um, what we'll see really is is organizations perhaps start to to um, bunker down and focus on key markets uh, to pair back from from you know potential growth strategies and other such um, uh, business plans Okay, so just a quick roundup of measures in place. Uh, how are organizations responding? As I mentioned, employee uh, productivity, employee uh, uh, productivity is down. Um, but on the whole, we've seen organizations uh, respond very positively to employee well-being. Now, of course, you may challenge that, you may have different experiences, but from our survey, we've seen that, that employee uh, well-being has been one of the most um, important uh, response mechanisms that businesses have deployed um, and really I think that's quite understandable I mean there's obviously the issue around reputation risk organizations don't want to be seen to be laying people off unnecessarily thinking about shareholder profits thinking about um, you know senior leaders within an organization they want to ensure that their 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 workers are looked after cared for because fundamentally they are their consumers um, and if you don't look after your consumers, you damage your personal, uh, your, you know, your corporate reputation and people choose not to buy from you in the future. There have been a number of anecdotal examples of companies that have um, uh, targeted employees first. Uh, I can think of a few organisations in the UK, namely a couple of football clubs um, that decided to make staff redundant or furlough them. Uh, and take government money rather than using, you know, shareholder or owner uh, wealth to support their employees. So there's there have been lots of good examples. Um, unfortunately, there'd be a handful of, of quite bad examples as well. 
Uh, we've seen the deployment of flexible working uh, arrangements, uh, undoubtedly with um, governments uh, imposing lockdowns. People have had to work from home. They've had to uh, change how they how they operate, how they organise. Um, lots of cost reduction strategies, delays in investment, as I've mentioned. Uh, looking at cash flow is one of the big challenges, and then banks and debt negotiation. And 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 Alain has mentioned uh, a bit about that earlier on, um, and I'll, I'll come on to that again later on, but I think that's one of the big um, uh, responses that will uh, that needs to increase, um, and we can discuss that a bit further on. Um, I think uh, this is, this. I wanted to touch upon this slide very briefly, and this is looking at um, what organizations are doing with employment. Now, I will say um, this might look negative, uh, but actually, it's relatively positive in the sense that voluntary separation schemes, i.e. redundancies and such, are quite far down the list in terms of uh, solutions. Recruitment freezes, so, so not taking on new roles, um, that's been the biggest uh, pickup, that's had the biggest pickup. It's entirely understandable. Uh, if people are looking to save costs, looking to, to save capital, then you're not going to be growing your staff. Um, then you're not going to be paying bonuses, as you can see. Um, you might be looking to uh, free salaries. Uh, you may have an annual salary increase that's been frozen. Salary cuts. We know that some organisations are asking employees to to take salary cuts, either to to work on a four day rotation or three day rotation with with a, an associated pay cut. Um, contractors, part time workers, they've been affected probably slightly more in that with with organizations not expanding recruitment, they're not taking on contractors either. So, so that is a bit of a margin, a, a, a grouping within society that have been uh, quite, quite negatively affected, um, certainly from a government perspective as well. I'll come on to that in a bit. Um, but yeah, there we go. Uh, it, it's, and then looking at no leave, no pay leave and such like that, that's, that's again, further down the list. Um, I think it's one of those measures that you don't really want to bring into, into force. Uh, but of course, if you're looking for a company viability, then some organizations may, uh, may have to resort to that. Okay. Looking at responses as a whole. Now this is, um, a slightly damning, um, statistic of the effectiveness of government stimulus packages. Again, looking at the dates of the survey ended at the end of March, it may be that um, organizations have grown more positive about the effectiveness of their stimulus packages. Uh, it may not have changed. I should mention that we're actually doing a second round for this survey and I'll, and I'll share the link later on. Um, and that in effect is to look at uh, how, how, how opinions have changed. But at the time of this survey, only 17% considered the stimulus package effective, which is which is which is uh, not great from a, um, uh, a government reputation perspective, but also actually for for just its sheer effectiveness. You know, if 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 businesses think that governments are getting it wrong, then they need to very quickly adjust what they are implementing to support businesses to continue. Um, I mentioned earlier on, I mean, this obviously is quite damning on governments, but thinking about businesses themselves, uh, only 55% of respondents to our survey had an effective business continuity plan in place. Um, now, this isn't to suggest that everyone should have predicted a global pandemic. Um, that's, of course, uh, unreasonable. Many organisations uh, would not be thinking about that. Small businesses, large businesses would not be thinking about pandemic, even if they had considered a pandemic, understanding what the effects of it would have been on global supply chains, on um, on staff working, on on health and well-being uh, would have been uh, relatively low. So whilst it's a relatively low figure, it's it's not it's not um, it's it's relatively understandable. Uh, it's, it's important to look at the two numbers at the bottom, 29% um, not having one in place at all, 16% having one, but it was ineffective. I think that just goes to show how, uh, how the uncertainty around Corona is affecting um, organizations on a whole. Okay, uh, I'm gonna whistle through this bit just very quickly because I don't think 
uh, it needs too much attention paid. There are some differences between large and small businesses. Um, large businesses are much, uh, it's much easier for large businesses to access capital. Um, small businesses ha have a much greater issue, whether it's, whether it's calling on, on banks, friends, family, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, large listed companies at least have the option that they can, uh, they have a lot more tools at their at their disposal, whether it's uh, debt issuances or other such uh, instruments. Um, it's one that affects small businesses much more uh, disproportionately. Um, purchases, again, uh, usually smaller companies will have a much less diversified range of products. Um, they're much more dependent on face-to-face -face purchases or the ability to uh, to to ship. Uh, we know that global freight has come down both from air and both sea, um, and so the ability to move stock is is much more um, much more restricted. Large organisations will often have uh, regional manufacturing hubs, and therefore aren't as as affected on that basis. Uh, supply chain again through through the restrictions to global freight um, that of course had a much bigger effect on smaller companies. Uh, impact on uh, on the, the difference between large and small. Again, it's unsurprising that that smaller companies are a lot more negative um, about the impacts of this um, because they're m much more fragile, much less able to to ride out big economic shocks like this. I mean, this isn't a case of consumer demand dropping. You know, we're talking about potentially over ten percent of GDP being affected. Uh, again, similar for, for revenue and similar for profit. I won't go through those in too much detail. Um, that just shows the uh, difference between, I mean, of course, that is quite stark between large and small organisations. Um, large organisations think more about business continuity. Of course, they have the resource to do it. They have uh, both the people and the, the generally the, the revenue to do so. They have a lot more um, sensitivity to to shocks in the in the uh, um, and so are uh, able to, to plan for these things better. Um, that's, I mean, it's not a criticism of small organisations. You can't expect a, a small, you know, business of say 200 people to plan for a plan for a, plan for a pandemic. Um, but to say that they had no business continuity plan whatsoever is not, that's not a good indictment on small businesses. Perhaps that's something where, uh, governments, uh, trade associations, business representation uh, organisations can do more in the future to make small and medium businesses more resilient, to give them advice. Uh, that is certainly something that we as an accounting body think about, that how our members and our students uh, and our partner organisations can provide advice to, to small and medium businesses and we'll be doing a lot more on that in the future. Okay, responses. Uh, these are just a couple of, or two or three slides on how to respond in the future. Um, we've seen uh, organizations think people first. I think that's been incredibly positive, looking at the, the health and well-being of their, the, their workers and their consumers. Um, there's an acknowledgement around the short term uh, that you need to focus on the short term to build up your, to either protect cash reserves or to, uh, to, to, to look at, um, deploying measures for, for the near term. I'm not gonna read all these out because the, the slides can be shared, but it's just something to, to consider. Um, analyze, again, this is perhaps a, a, a benefit of a large organization, um, but you have businesses large or small have assistance on hand, whether it's their, their accountant, their business advisors, um, who will be going through uh, government policies, government um, uh, response mechanisms with fine tooth comb to understand how uh, businesses can be take advantage of those of those tools and those stimulus packages um, and given everything that's going on with the uncertainty there might be uh, a greater call for organizations to think about um, what is their plan for the next six months six twelve months um, looking at where they can generate cash flow where they can uh, save costs where they can um, start building up uh, supply chains again or looking to diversify supply chains. 
and lastly anticipate um this this basically looks this is basically suggesting that companies take a a, a look at themselves um perhaps their entire structure perhaps their business models perhaps their 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 product place their product lines whatever it might be and start thinking about what does business look like in a new corona world um if we're going to continue seeing uncertainty whether this becomes a, a yearly issue whether this becomes something that comes over every five years whatever it might be uh looking for ways to adapt to plan to respond um actually look for opportunities as well you know this is i don't want to focus on amazon and and organizations like zoom too much i mean amazon of course is an e-commerce company has you know enormous wealth enormous distribution networks um and with people not being able to go to shops of course they will they will benefit um but that said organizations that don't currently engage in e-commerce for example should look to do so they should look to become first uh, um start start engaging on on e-commerce networks and distribution networks um they may look for for new div uh, products that can support customers in different ways we know that technology is going to be a big factor in the future um one thing one comment i'll make is that uh with organizations um having to uh support workers working from home uh, there's obviously been growth markets in in video conferencing uh, tools and such, um, but being at home so much has created new opportunities for other businesses. Whether it is improving the work uh, the the working environment at home or looking to capitalise on work life balance, that sorts of um, those sorts of uh, new new trends and new new ways of working. That's a, it's another opportunity to take. Uh, risks, obviously, okay, risk is a big one. Um, cyber risk, and we we as an organization will uh, talk about cyber risk a lot because as we move to new technologies, as we move to new ways of working, cyber threats become a lot more um, uh, prevalent. Uh, looking at your home security situation in terms of uh, you know internet security browser security and such that's all important um uh yeah and 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 looking at how networks can be attacked in different ways that's a, something to to consider as an organization um okay so moving on just very quickly about how we are responding everything all of our research all of our our response uh, advice is available online on our dedicated coronavirus hub um as of all of our research reports including the ima acca uh, gex reports um as i mentioned we are undertaking a second round of this survey um i will post the the link in the chat box shortly um if you are able to uh respond or or, or take part in it we'd be incredibly grateful um the response the uh the survey is in uh, a, a number of different languages so please do share within your organizations as well um and share with with uh clients or or um partners as you as you see fit um and that is everything from me uh i hope you found that useful uh it seems as i said before uh quite timely to have a response package like uh, looking at covid uh partnered up with our gex survey to show what the the next steps are for responding to a major downturn like this um yeah any questions please do feel free to fire them in or uh do email either myself or elaine afterwards um, and i'm sure we'll be happy to get back to you so thank you very much okay thank you very much uh for the for information for sharing uh, not only the impact but also the responses because i think the response is the is, is the word now it's uh, we all try to read up and listen to different podcasts to understand what are the possible ways that we can reboot the economy, both as, as, as countries, as companies, as well as as regular people. So, um, uh, so in so thank you very much for the link, because uh, we can now proceed to the questions. And like I said before, um, I encourage again, uh, our participants to add their questions. Um, we have a question from one of the uh, one of the people from the audience. Uh, yes, so Maya is asking about social projects. Uh, could you please, uh, Maya, uh, write in the chat box what kind of uh, social projects do you mean? Um, 
But here in Kazakhstan uh, right now, uh, the focus shifted more towards social enterprises. So it's probably something around, around those uh, lines. Um, so if you have uh, something to share about the social enterprises uh, projects, uh, how do you think it will be affected in the new um, reality? Uh, I'm happy to, 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 to give an initial answer and then Elaine, if you want to jump in afterwards. Um, look, I think uh, governments have been focused on getting businesses moving, um, ensuring that they have liquidity, ensuring that they have uh, packages of support for, for, um, for workers and for, uh, to ensure that, that people are, are not dropping into poverty. Um, charities, I, would, I don't want to say have been necessarily, charities and social enterprise haven't necessarily been an afterthought, um, but of course they've been perhaps uh, uh, less uh, supported than other types of organizations. Um, I think with social enterprises taking that slightly differently to charity, um, they may not necessarily receive the same sort of access to funding from governments directly. I know that in the UK, lots of business banks have been offering uh, packages of support, so non um, like loans and such that aren't tied to to property or anything like that that can help small businesses uh, um, stay stay active. What you might see actually is, and perhaps again this is something an experience from the UK or from my own uh, experience, is that there's been a much greater there's been an incredible like social response to this in terms of people and organisations helping each other out. Um, and of course there is government support, but actually looking at local communities, local neighborhoods, looking at um, support groups, we might see in response to this a lot more of those sorts of organizations being formed to address very, very specific needs on very, very localized um, basis. So it could be a local, whether it's a necessarily local food bank, but also local educational charities, local um, uh, mental health charities or, or, or uh, support groups that can tap into um, to that are bringing sort of people together. I think because Corona has been a leveler of people, hopefully, well, not hopefully actually, that's the wrong way of putting it. Because because people of all parts of society have been affected by Corona, perhaps disproportionately, but 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 everyone generally has been affected by it. Uh, people are perhaps are thinking in a lot more of a um, giving space where if they've been less affected by it because it's something that's on their doorstep it's something that they've you know felt greater um uh affinity to because it's part of their neighborhood elaine i don't know whether if there's anything you wanted to to add to that oh i think you're on mute oh you're you're on mute yeah Thank you for that. <laughs> no, very good answer, and I totally agree, actually. And, and, and maybe something to add is, is for social enterprises, what you see in, in many countries is that actually banks are also taking their responsibility to support the social enterprises. So, for example, you see large banks here in the Netherlands, but also in other countries in Europe, um, they, they delay the payments of interest. Uh, social enterprises have to pay over their mortgages, for example, or the debt they are having. Um, so I think um, those are also things that the banks are taking responsibility here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, in the last few weeks, we have seen some, uh, like Vikas have mentioned, some local charity organizations helping at this uncertain times to those who are challenged. So could be one of the ways. Um, well, if, we're, if we decided to talk about regular people, uh, before we got a question from the, one of the participants, what other, what other uh, actions and uh, uh, ways how regular people can help to reboot the economy? What can uh, people do? People who are not uh, part of the organizations who are aimed to do so, but uh, just, oh, I think Vikas, you're, you're mute. Oh, I am, Alain. I don't know if you wanna, if you wanna. Uh... Yeah, I, 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 what you see is, of course, the whole recovery of the economy. Of course, now the, the governments are supporting the, the economies and the companies, but in the end, uh, the, the the economy is growing because uh, consumers are spending money. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's the key to recovery. Um, and especially, I think, the people um, who still have a job and are not affected uh, financially, uh, that they also have to take responsibility. Uh, so uh, don't stop paying the bill to daycare or uh, when restaurants are opening again, uh, go to a restaurant again. Uh, it's nice, mm -hmm. but also those things. So really, it, it will all start with when uh, consumers are spending their money again. I think that's the road to recovery. Okay. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I, I made a couple of notes and, and the, the, the big note I said was basically spend, don't invest. You know, we know that interest rates are going to be uh, are at historic lows. Um, this isn't the time to be saving money. If the government is putting money into your pocket um, through, you know, stimulus packages, go out and spend it. I mean, perhaps this is a personal opinion, but spend local, spend with small businesses, um, spend with ones that aren't able to uh, to to access cash as easily, um, uh, and and also and and spend on yourself. Like, look at look at invest in yourself. You know, your own your own training your own sort of well-being um ensure that you uh are able to come out of this healthily happily um mm -hmm. and and prepared for a, a slightly different future okay uh actually our the arm of aifc that we're in we're also focused on professional development which is actually mainly focused on that uh what and you have just mentioned about training and educating ourselves what are the uh, possible trends in education that do you think are arising at the moment and how can uh, the youth prepare themselves for that uncertain future? Yeah, well, well what, 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 we, what we see is that, especially for finance and accounting people, uh, forward looking, providing insights is becoming mm -hmm. more and more important. Um, so, but what I believe, and I strongly believe, of course, it's very important to earn your certifications, and it can be the CMA, that can be the one of ACCA, uh, it doesn't matter actually, but after that, uh, I think continuing professional education becomes more and more important, mm -hmm. uh, because nowadays technology and big data is very important, and how you adapt to technology. So when you earned your certification maybe 10 or 20 years ago, you really have to, to reskill and follow um, uh, courses in terms of big data, for example, and data analytics. And so that's, I think, a, a very big trend we will continue to see it becoming more and more important. Um, I think that's also one of the reasons because as IMA, we were also thinking, okay, when, what can we do as professional body in this, uh, this current disruption? So we decided to open up uh, all our educational resources also to non-IMA members. Uh, so uh, they can still go to our website, imanet.org. Uh, and just uh, sign up and then they don't have to become a member, uh, but they can have access to all our resources like uh, professional education, uh, because we strongly believe that uh, it's becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I heartily agree. I think I think I would echo Alain's point on, on, you know, the need to understand the need to understand new technologies, understand how they work, their opportunities. Um, uh, what they're going to be doing in the future, what their challenges are. Uh, I would say to, to complement that um, very much is, is thinking about um, people skills, so emotional intelligence, uh, thinking about creativity, how to work with technology, um, mm -hmm. you know, how to ensure that you are indispensable for the future. Um, I think around the education point uh, as, a, as a whole content, as a whole topic, sorry, we're going to see education in its delivery mechanisms change. I think we're going to move to a lot more in terms of digital del delivery mechanisms. Universities are going to have to change if this coronavirus becomes an ongoing issue and we have to maintain social distancing for any reason. Um, but that, that, that creates opportunities for people to learn remotely, to learn <coughs> a, a, a pool of topics because they can pick up online courses in, in different areas to, to have this sort of like portfolio type learning approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, and Elaine, you have shared the um, the link, right? And the resources, you mean, th these are things that people can read up, right? These are publications yes, and indeed. materials. Uh, yeah, so then they can have access to our online webinars, uh, also the online mm -hmm. courses, uh, the podcast, uh, just go to that website. Okay. 
And that would be a good supplement for the preparation part, right? For the certification program. Yes, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we will share the link uh, with the students after this. Uh, okay. Also, um, you have mentioned about the policy responses. And uh, you have also said that uh, some of the people think that the policy responses have not been effective. Uh, what are the what are the responses that governments can do to to make them more effective? What are the ways? Yeah, look, I mean, this is this is um, again. Elaine's mentioned it. Like this, I mm -hmm. mentioned. I said. I said, spend, don't invest. You know, this is really. Um, the same applies for governments. You know, this this is with low interest rates uh, and rates getting lower. This isn't the time for government to to retrench. This is the time for governments to pump in as much cash as they are able to do so uh, via banks in terms of uh, loans and such. So getting banks to loan more to businesses uh, via sort of wage wage schemes, getting uh, money into people's pockets. Um, it needs to be faster. It needed to be faster at the time in the UK. We've had it. It's been quite, it's been relatively well received, but I think it's been staggered, um, perhaps slightly too late. I think they've uh, delayed, um, they've been slightly slow in, in addressing people like uh, contractors, self-employed people, people that have recently, um, you know, left a job and in, in search of a new job and no longer have an employer that they can claim a furlough payment from. So, so the speed at which they reacted to these different variations of society uh, was perhaps too slow. Um, but I, I think there isn't, there is a, a need to, to carry on pumping in mm -hmm. uh, more and more capital. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, since AIFC is also, well, is mostly involved in the investment area, um, maybe uh, you could share uh, some of the potential investment trends that could emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Since I, I think the, 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 the nature of the investment will change overall in the world as it's not as interrelated as before. So do you think um, some emerging trends are already appearing at the moment? That yeah. Uh, I can uh, yeah have to suggest things. Okay, so so I think we've um, there are a number of areas. So the first thing I would say overarching is is sort of digital first. Um, we th this 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 crisis has brought forward I think for a lot of people the need to invest in digital technologies sooner rather than later. We, it's probably shortened that scale by five to ten years. Uh, it means that organisations are going to have to adapt. To digital first uh, technologies and that's everything from health so through remote health monitoring and everything else through to agri-tech looking at um, how we can continue to produce crop generation and do it in the most effective and efficient way especially if you don't have global people mobility obviously that's a that's quite a big issue in the UK with with Brexit and everything else that's going on um, uh, diversification of um, energy now of course we for oil dependent countries, uh, oil prices are, are, are low. And of course, that can be a good thing for consumers, a bad thing for producers. But we know that solar rates, solar installation rates are, are, are lower than they've sort of ever been. And so it's a good time to diversify away from um, from necessary uh, oils. Uh, domestic manufacturing as supply chain, global supply chains are broken. Um, and I would say looking at mobility domestic mobility as opposed to international mobility. Um, uh, we've seen the, the the growth of, you know, bicycles and everything else uh, rise rapidly in the UK. And of course, this is because people don't want to say taxis and, and public transport, but having low cost, clean, green uh, mobility solutions uh, is going to be really important for the future as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, very, very good one and, and I would like to echo that indeed it, it's indeed very good and what I think is also a, a major investment trend in the future is that of course when, when we invest in companies we are looking at the ROI of course that's maybe the most important things but invest, investors will have a much closer look now on um, business recovery business continuity mm -hmm. uh, what are the plans of the companies they're investing in uh, for example, nowadays everything is about cash flow. What's your, how are you going to extend the cash flow run rate? What's your cash burn rate? 
Uh, so those kind of things, I think investors will have a much closer look on when they make the decision uh, to invest in a company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and we have just uh, previously talked about more on the supply side of the labor. What do you think about the demand side of the labor? What kind of, uh, uh, what kind of um, skills and uh, maybe even majors would different companies want to see in people? Well, when you look at, at financial, at finance people, accountants, um, I think that the, the soft skills are becoming more and more important. Um, and, and also what we see in this current disruption is that flexibility, uh, how do you adapt to a new situation, uh, is becoming more and more important. It's even crucial, I believe. Um, I think also... Uh, when you look at finance people, um, they have to be more commercially driven uh, to become that business partner. Uh, so the people who have a combination of the really the, 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 the finance skills and, and also in combination with soft skills and are more commercially driven, uh, those are the people who will end up as, as CFOs, for example. Uh, they are CFO material. Um, and I think that this whole current disruption has really proven that those are the skills, uh, not only for today, but also for the future. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would echo that. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from the participants? I see Please some ask them in the not in English, chat box. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Please add uh, if anyone have any questions. Uh, also, do you, since I know, for example, Vikas, you work with emerging economies mm. um, also, right? And so what do you think is the response and the situation uh, in emerging economies as opposed to non-emerging economies? And uh, uh, how could, uh, if, if there's any differences, how could we explain them? Yeah, look, I, I think um, what's going to be, uh, and I have to, I have to be, sort of be careful with my words here, um, be wary of existing and new foreign debt. Um, uh, separating sort of like commodities dependent economies from emerging economies, I think that's the different challenges. But I think there's, there's a, there is going to be a big risk around um, where uh, new money is coming from in the future. Um, and the ability to service existing debt. Um, and I say this in the context of a, a, f a sort of a fissure between, call it the West and the East, or at least uh, mm -hmm. um, the US and the UK and China, perhaps, to, to a lesser extent the EU. But I think that's going to be a, um, a big challenge for emerging economies that may be turning to, to uh, financiers for investment. Um, that will be one of the big challenges for emerging economies, I think. Uh, I was going to say this earlier on, but I think hospitality is one of those sectors that are that may be a uh, a big issue for emerging economies, ones that are very dependent on hospitality and tourism. Uh, I, I don't think the uh, airline industries are going to be surging back anytime soon. I think people are mm -hmm. still going to be quite wary of, of traveling far and afield. Uh, and so they may need to look for new industries to um, support the uh, to substitute for, for for hospitality and tourism for foreign capital on that basis. A lot of countries actually have been quite dependent on it. Certainly in, say, Southeast Asia, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where they have quite a big tourist influx, uh, and perhaps haven't looked to alternative uh, sectors. That would be my sort of. Um, my point and i think going back to the sort of us uk versus china perspective mm -hmm. um i think countries may be asked to uh almost pick a side or they there'll be a, a line drawn in the sand saying you know you've got you've got uh, in effect a slightly more pressing choice between di diplomatically are you are you aligning with china and it's in its um uh 
its ways and means or are you, are you more lean towards the west and of course being on the the silk road the belt and road uh joining between the two sort of the center of it i think kazakhstan and central asia will be mm. um put in a relatively uh potentially a relatively challenging position on that front okay thank you um if we don't have any more questions uh I think I, ha I have exhausted my list of questions at this point. Um, if probably at this point, I would like to thank uh, our speakers and also participants to share today, uh, this afternoon in Kazakhstan and actually noon in your countries, as far as I know. And um, I think you have touched upon very important points today. And uh, like, you, like you have also mentioned, we could look at some of the slides that you have shared with us, right, today. Yeah, I'll send, I'm happy to send my deck okay. to you, but the new deck and, and, and yeah. Sure, sure. And also, yeah, thank you. I'll also share you my deck, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, um, yes, and uh, thank you for sharing this, the, the links. And um, um, yeah, I think they will be very helpful to our students because we have students who are doing the certification programs. Um, yes, and uh, I think at this point we can finish. Uh, and uh, participants, if you have any questions, please email them to us. Um, and uh, I wish everyone uh, uh, luck and uh, I guess um, lots of well being at this uncertain times. And I hope we all can uh, pass through it uh, successfully and most importantly, peacefully. So uh, thank you. And yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting us. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much and have a good night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank Take you. Take care. Bye.